<laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Okay, um, good morning. Um, today, um, I want to talk about the uh, past two discovery on neutrino oscillations. <coughs> well, first of all, you see two photos. One is, one is Super Kamiokande, the other is the snow experiment. And these experiments contributed a lot for the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And therefore, and today, I'm going to essentially discuss the discovery of neutrino oscillations. <coughs> oh. no. Okay, yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is the outline of this talk. Uh, first, I'll, I'll discuss briefly on the early days of neutrinos. Then, I'd, I'd like to move on to discovery of neutrino oscillations, atmospheric neutrino oscillations, solar neutrino oscillations. And also, I want to briefly discuss the third oscillation channel discovery. And before finishing, I want to talk about the status and future, again, very briefly. And I want to summarize this talk. Um, some of the materials, well, actually, I, I I use from Mac, from the file presented by at McDonald's, so I want to thank him. <coughs> okay, um, let's start. Well, first, um, I want to talk about solar neutrinos. Of course, the sun generates energy by nuclear fusion processes. And neutrinos are created by these processes. Uh, therefore, the observation of solar neutrinos is very important to understand the energy generation mechanism in the sun. Well, in the middle, I show the energy spectrum of the solar neutrinos. And therefore, if we observe these neutrinos, we understand this energy generation mechanism of the sun. Then I want to mention that the pioneering Homestake experiment observed solar neutrinos for the first time. Well, his observation was more than half a century ago. However, there's a problem. The observed event rate was only about one third of the prediction. Well, people were puzzled. Well, people argued that maybe in some detail, there could have been some problem in the experiment or maybe in the calculation of the solar neutrino flux. Or maybe we do not understand neutrinos well. Anyway, um, people thought it's very important to have another experiment to confirm the home stake results, for example. Um, then there were several subsequent solar neutron experiments. The first one was the Kamiokande experiment. Actually, as you may know, Kamiokande was originally designed to observe proton decays, but with the high photon, effi photon detection efficiency, um, the leader of the experiment, Professor Koshiba um, proposed to improve the Kamiokande detector so that Kamiokande can observe solar neutrinos. Well, I, I want to tell you that he proposed this idea 
already in 1983 when he, well, when, well, when he, well, when Kamiokande started the experiment. <coughs> then, after several years of the uh, um, improvement works, and finally, Kamiokande published the first solar neutrino results in 1989. So, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is the result. And the histogram, histogram is the prediction by the standard solar model. And the black circles show the data. And clearly, the data was much lower than expected. <coughs> uh, by the way, I want to tell you, Kamiokande was only observed um, high energy part of the solar neutrinos. In particular, in this figure, the threshold energy was about 10 MeV. Then, the next experiments are SAGE in Russia and GALEX GNO in Italy. In both experiments, uh, gallium was the target, and therefore, um, this experiment was sensitive to the PP neutrinos, and therefore, people were expected, say, if these experiments observed significantly lower solar neutrino flux than predicted, um, then it is likely that neutrinos have some unknown properties. Then the first experiment, uh, first result came from SAGE, and in, in their 1991 paper, they wrote, we observed the capture rate to be about, to be 20 plus 15 minus 20 statistical, plus minus 32 systematic solar neutrino unit, resulting in a limit of less than 79 solar neutrino unit, 90% confidence level. This to be compared with 132 SNU predicted by the standard solar model. So the initial result from SAGE was much lower than expected. But soon, um, GALEX reported their result. And this is a, a summary of their result. And on average, the observed solar neutrino rate was 83 SNU solar neutrino unit. So, well, in the end, um, well, this was rather statistical fluctuation, and the final number was closer to this number. Anyway, um, the all, all of these experiments observed um, deficit of solar neutrinos, but still the situation was inconclusive. And here I'd like to summarize the status before the end of the 20th century. So here is the um, gallium flux measurements as compared with the standard solar model. So compared with the standard solar model, the gallium experiment observed about slightly less than 60% of the prediction. Ah, oh, by the way, the um, horizontal axis is the energy. So the gallium experiment was sensitive to PP solar neutrinos. Then the next one is the uh, chlorine experiment, home stake experiment. Well, as I mentioned, um, their result was much, much lower than expected. And here's the Kamiokande result, and also I, mean, I wrote the super K result here. So, in the 20th century, several experiments observed solar neutrinos, <coughs> and these solar neutrino experiments observed the deficit of solar neutrinos, but we are not sure what was the cause of the deficit. Also, I think, uh, I forgot to write down here, but I think I should mention 
in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s, um, people had a really progress in the understanding of the neutrino oscillations in matter. And therefore, already in the 20th century, um, people analyzed these solar neutrino data and estimated the um, neutrino oscillation parameters, assuming that the, um, we understand um, neutrino oscillations in matter, so-called MSW effect. <clears throat> OK, now I want to change to other topic, that is atmospheric neutrinos. As you know, cosmic ray particles enter into the atmosphere, and they interact with air nucleus, and typically pions are produced. And of course, pions decay to a muon, then to an electron. Electron, Therefore, during this decay chain, neutrinos are created. And these neutrinos are observed in underground experiments. Oh, by the way, um, well, later, the, as I mentioned, uh, and maybe as you know, the atmospheric neutrino observations led to the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And I think there are two key features. Um, one is we understood the nu mu over nu e ratio very well. Furthermore, we expected the uptime ratio to be very well understood, and essentially that, that this ratio is one. <coughs> and also, I want to mention, of course, for upward going neutrinos, these neutrinos travel long distances. <coughs> uh, well, this is maybe a slightly old uh, plot, but anyway, I want to mention, for example, New mu over new e ratio is calculated to be an accuracy of about 2% below 5 GeV. Also, uh, the right figure shows the up versus down flux ratio, and it is very close to 1 in high energy region, much GeV region, and calculated, oh, oh, sorry, 1% uh, and accurately calculated, that means well, we understood the up versus down ratio with an accuracy of 1% or less. <coughs> now, let's now, I want to move on to the observation of atmospheric neutrinos. The first observation of atmospheric neutrinos were carried out by two independent experiments. In fact, here I show these two experiments. One was, in, uh, one was carried out in India, um, shown in the left, and other, another one was carried out in South Africa, shown in the right. And in 1965, these, uh, these experiments observed atmospheric neutrinos for the first time. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that these experiments were carried out in extremely deep underground. In particular, this South Africa experiment, as far as I know, the depth was approximately three kilometers, extremely deep. And then, as you know, uh, about 50 years ago, grand unified theories appeared, and these theories predicted that a proton, proton should decay. And therefore, several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s to confirm the idea of grand unified theories. And here I list the proton decay experiment in the 80s, and for these experiments, atmospheric neutrinos were the background for the proton decay searches. <coughs> so, 
because atom cyclic neutrino is the most serious background to the proton decay searches, it was necessary to understand atom cyclic neutrino interactions. And during these studies, a significant deficit of atom cyclic muon neutrino event was observed in Kamiokande and later in IMB experiments. Here, I summarize um, their measurement results. The horizontal axis is mu over U ratio of the data over the same ratio of the Monte Carlo prediction. So you see both experiments observed significant deficit of mu on neutrinos. But again, um, you are in the 20s, well, no, sorry. Again, these experiments were unable to understood what was the cause of the deficit of mu or neutrino deficit. <coughs> um, but I want to mention one experimental result. Kamiokande um, studied much GB neutrinos um, observed in their detector. And they looked at the uh, zin sang distribution for muon-like events. The data are shown here. Uh, cosine zin is one means downgoing neutrinos and minus one means upward going neutrinos. And they came from the other side of the earth. And they observed this kind of um, data and, well, clearly, upward, there is a deficit in the upward going neutrino flux. But unfortunately, the event rate was not very high. Uh, therefore, the, the error bar was rather large. Therefore, the statistical significance of the uh, up-down up ratio deviated from unity was less than 3 sigma, 2.9 sigma. Therefore, well, th this was interesting, but not conclusive. <coughs> and clearly, um, because the problem was a deficit of the, uh, if, well, no, sorry, the, the problem was the lack of the statics, statistics. Therefore, it was clear we needed much larger detector, and that was super kamiokande. OK, now I'd like to move on to the discovery of uh, neutrino oscillations. The first is the atom sec neutrino oscillations. <coughs> well, of course, you know Super Kamiokande. Um, it is a 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector. And at present, it is a large international collaboration. Super Kamiokande has about 230 collaborators from these, um, I guess, 11 countries. <coughs> um, well, first of all, I want to show this photo. Um, this photo was taken at the Institute for Cosmic Research in 1992. At that time, um, we had a discussion on the international collaboration between Japan and the United States in Super Kamiokande. Well, uh, well, this was a very intense meeting, uh, but finally we agreed to work together. And well, we were happy with this agreement, and you see uh, there are many bottles of beers. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, the Super Kamiokande was um, approved by the Japanese government to construct in 1991. The construction period was for five years. And um, for the First four years, um, the main work was the excavation and the construction of the 
um, stainless steel tank. Then in the last year, uh, physicists came to the Super Kamiokande site and started working for the construction. And this photo was taken in the spring of 1995, when we started the installation of the photo multiplier tubes onto the Super Kamiokande tank. Um, first of all, you see many people. And in fact, as far as I can tell, maybe 80% of them are physicists. So in this year, um, many of the Super Kamiokande collaborators came to Kamioka to construct the Super Kamiokande detector. We worked for about a year to install the photo detectors. Uh, by the way, at that time, we were installing the photo detectors, photo multiplier tubes, onto the top of the Super Kamiokande tank. However, uh, this is the bottom of the, of the Super Kamiokande tank. That means we installed the top photo multiplier tank, a uh, photo multiplier tubes at the bottom of the tank. Then, after finishing the installation of the pho uh, top photomat prior tubes, all the top structure was raised from the bottom to the 40 meter high. Well, we can, well of course, physicists cannot do this. <laughs> this is a 300 ton structure. Whole structure was raised by 40 meters. Anyway, um, the, all this kind of work was done in this year. And indeed, I think we were very successful. And early in 1996, um, we began to put water into the Super Kamiokande tank. Well, this photo was taken from the top of the Super Kamiokande. And of course, you see the water level. And also, you see there are people there. Well, oh, of course, uh, I think we were rather successful, but not completely. Well, actually, during the construction, we were not completely control the airflow. That means dusty air came into the Super Kamiokande tank. Therefore, um, during the construction, the dust covered the upper part of the hot multiplier tube. So we decided to clean each hot multiplier tube once again. So during that time, we worked for the cleaning while putting pure water into the Super Kamiokande tank. <coughs> anyway, well, the detector worked fine. Um, essentially, from the beginning of the experiment, um, from the beginning of the experiment, we observed this kind of clean, single muon-like event, electron-like event, and this is partially contained event, where the event vertex is inside the fiducial volume of the, of the Super Kamiokande tank, but at least one particle, typically a muon, exits from the detector. Also, we observed upward going muons, they are high energy uh, muon neutrino interactions occurring in the rock below the Super Kamiokande tank. So, uh, this histogram shows the energy distributions for these events. And you see, in Super Kamiokande, we observed neutrinos from about 100 MeV to uh, up to 1 TeV or even more. And all these events are used in the data analysis. 
And of course, um, uh, we would like to understand what was the cause of the muon neutrino deficit observed in Kamiokande and IMB experiments. <coughs> um, and of course, and one of the idea was to clearly observe the up, up versus down asymmetry of the neutrino flux. If this is observed, that could be a clear evidence for neutrino oscillations. <coughs> and indeed, uh, in two years, uh, we were able to present our first main result. And this was a slide we presented at the Neutrino 98 conference. And here, we presented the zin sang distribution for new E events and new mu events in the multi GB energy region. And cosine theta 1 means downgoing neutrinos, and minus 1 means upward going neutrinos. And you see, for electron neutrino events, the up versus down asymmetry is essentially, uh, well, essentially actually consistent with no asymmetry. But for the uh, muon neutrino events, uh, there was a very large deficit of upward going neutrinos. In addition, of course, we had the zin sang distribution for upward going muons or uh, um, mu over E ratio measurement in the sub GB energy range and so on. Therefore, we had various um, event sample to test neutrino oscillations. And all these data were just consistent. Uh, therefore, Super Kamiokande concluded that the observed zin sang dependent deficit and the other supporting data gave evidence for neutrino oscillations. <coughs> well, uh, this, um, pres this result was accepted by many uh, neutrino physicists. And therefore, from that time on, the people's interest was the studies of neutrino oscillations. And since then, there have been many neutrino experiments that contributed to the study of uh, neutrino oscillations. In particular, in this, in this biograph, the experiments that contributed to the new mu to new tau oscillations are shown. Also, uh, I, I want to mention, soon after the uh, discovery of atomic new neutrino oscillations, um, there have been as intense um, activities in long, base, long baseline accelerator-based experiments. The first was the K2K experiment. They reported uh, this result. Uh, first of all, they observed the deficit of muon neutrinos. In addition, they observed the hint for the energy spectrum distortion, which is just consistent with the expectation of neutrino oscillations. Then the next one was the minus. And if we look at the energy spectrum, the energy dependent deficit of muon neutrino is much clearly seen. And therefore, the oscillation parameter was much better determined. Now, the present generation of experiments are T2K and NOVA. And in these experiments, they tune the beam energy so that uh, the peak of the beam energy is the oscillation maximum. Therefore, they should be able to observe the maximum oscillation effect. Uh, by, the, by the way, the tuning of the beam energy is done by using the off-axis beam technique. By tuning the off-axis angle, they tune the best uh, neutrino energy. In any case, the effect of oscillation is very clear. Compared with the no oscillation case, the actually observed event rate was much fewer than expected. 
This is T2K and this is NOVA, and both experiments are just consistent as far as the mu or neutrino deficit is concerned. <coughs> um, well, of course, in the previous uh, pages, we only discussed the disappearance of mu or neutrinos. But if the oscillation is nu mu to nu tau, uh, there should be an appearance of tau neutrinos. And in fact, opera contributed a lot on this, um, on this tau, on tau appearance. And this is one of the events they observed. Well, they have the emergence um, tracker. Therefore, they are very precise in, in observing these details. And they observed, well, in, according to this uh, report, they observed five tau neutrino candidates, and the expected background was 0 0.25. Um, so there was no, well, it, it was very clear that tau is indeed appearing. In addition to opera, uh, Super Kamioka and, and Ice Cube are studying the tau neutrino appearance. Um, well, of course, in Super Kamioka and Ice Cube, an um, event by event identification of tau neutrino appearance is not possible. Uh, therefore, in this experiment, um, statistical analysis was carried out. And for example, in case of Super Kamiokande, they looked at the Zin Sangu distribution for tau like events, and there was a clear excess in the upward going direction, and that was just consistent with the expected tau appearance. So, uh, this way, a Super Kamiokande and also Ice Cube confirmed the tau neutrino appearance. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the solar neutrino oscillations. <coughs> As I mentioned, in the 20th century, uh, there were several solar neutrino experiments, and these experiments observed the deficit of solar neutrinos. But during the 20th century, we were unable to get an conclusion, very clear conclusion on the, on the reason for the deficit. But here I'd like to introduce um, a paper that was presented by Herb Chen in 1985. Um, he had an idea to directly, di uh, well, well, the title of the paper was direct approach to resolve the solar neutrino problem. <laughs> well, in this paper, he wrote, a direct approach to resolve the solar neutrino problem would be to observe neutrinos by use of both neutral current and charge current reactions. Then the total neutrino flux and the electron neutrino flux would be separately determined to provide independent tests of the neutrino oscillation hypothesis and the standard solar model. A large, heavy water Cherenkov detector, sensitive to neutrinos from boron A decay via the neutral current reaction, nu D going to nu plus P plus N, and the charged current reaction, nu E plus D going to E minus plus P plus P, is suggested for this purpose. So he, he proposed to use heavy water detector, then this uh, detector should have this kind of charged reaction. In addition, um, neutral current reaction should be observed. <coughs> okay, this was the idea. Well, anyway, this was a great idea. Uh, therefore, <laughs> so soon after this idea, uh, there was a proposal to build a neutrino observatory in Sudbury, Canada, uh, using heavy water. 
And well, this photo is from uh, at McDonald's. And well, they are the initial people in the snow collaboration. Um, <coughs> anyway, uh, based on Herb Chen's idea, um, people constructed the snow detector in Canada. And the, as you know, the depth is two kilometers, very deep. And in fact, this depth is important to reduce the uh, cosmic ray um, mu-generated radioactivities. <coughs> the snow experiment was constructed again in underground. Well, in Super Kamiokande, we carried various material by a horizontal tunnel. But in case of snow, they carried the detector material by a vertical shaft. So, well, according to Art McDonald, one million pieces of pieces were transferred down to the three, down in the three meter by three meter by four meter mine case and reassembled under ultra clean conditions. <coughs> so I think the construction was much more complicated in snow. Anyway, um, the snow detector was filled with pure and uh, heavy water in April 1999. <coughs> uh, by the way, one of the potential problem was to measure the neutrons uh, produced by this neutral current reaction in order to observe this neutral current interaction event, you need to observe neutron produced by the interaction. So in order to observe the neutron, they had three ways. In fact, the observation of the neutron is not so easy. Therefore, they, they decided to use three different methods in an experiment. The first method was to use simply to use the pure water. Well, neutrons are captured on deuteron by this reaction. Then the gamma ray of 6.25 MeV is, is, will be emitted. And therefore, they wanted to observe this gamma ray, but the efficiency is rather low. In the second phase, they put salt into the heavy water. Two tons of NaCl was uh, put into the uh, D2 water. <coughs> and then the neutrons should be captured by chlorine 35. And then a total of 8.6 MeV gamma rays would be emitted, and uh, therefore, uh, they observed the Cherenkov of photons generated by, uh, by these electromagnetic cascades. And well, neutron capture cross-section is much higher uh, on chlorine 35. Um, and also the total energy release is much higher compared with 6.25 MeV. And therefore, efficiency is higher. And finally, in the third phase, um, they used helium-3 counters to observe neutrons. As you know, helium-3 counters are very useful um, counter to measure the neutron. And therefore, they put many helium-3, ultra-clean helium-3 counters into the um, D2O water. And the efficiency was about 30%. So in this way, um, they would like to confirm 
that the difficult neutral current measurements, that is neutron measurement, is uh, accurately measured. <coughs> In fact, the snow experiment was very successful. And this is a plot based on the salt phase data. And they measured the elastic scattering and neutral current interactions in addition, uh, sorry, elastic scatterings, and in addition, of course, they observed the uh, charge current interactions. And the horizontal axis is new E flux, and the vertical axis is new mu plus new tau flux. And of course, new neutral current measurement has a constraint on the total neutrino flux, and electro. Uh, a charge current reaction has a constraint only on the electron neutrino flux, therefore this line. In addition, elastic scattering has an, this kind of constraint. And first of all, you see, uh, by the way, here is super K data. And you see that three or four different measurements intersect at the point around here. And that, that is the evidence for finite new mu plus new tau flux. And of course, the sun can only generate new E's. Uh, therefore, this is the evidence for oscillations. In addition, the results from the three phase of the snow experiment were consistent. So this way, we understood that the solar neutrino deficit was due to new E to new mu plus new tau conversion. But, well, there were people who are not completely satisfied with the snow data alone, because in principle, it was possible to think about other mechanisms to convert new E to new mu plus new tau. And here, the Kamland experiment played a very important role. And Kamland is a one kiloton liquid scintillator detector constructed at the location of Kamiokande. Um. <coughs> and in the early, uh, early this century, there were many nuclear power stations around Kamland at a distance of about 180 kilometers. Um, this circle is the 180 kilometers from the Kamland location. So that means uh, Kamland can be uh, effectively a long baseline reactor neutrino oscillation experiment. And well, this is the result from Kamland. <coughs> uh, this is the energy spectrum neutrinos for, from nuclear new power stations observed in Kamland. And you see, compared with the no oscillation expectations, and the observed event rate was fewer, and also it dependent on the energy. And well, they also showed the survival probability as a function of L over E. And well, you see there is a um, deficit, recovery, deficit, recovery, and so on. And this was just consistent with the oscillation prediction. So by looking at these data, um, we were convinced that new E really oscillate. <coughs> now, OK. Um, before moving on, I would like to mention other important solar neutrino experiments. One is the Borexino experiment. Um, Borexino was designed to measure sub MEB solar neutrinos. And indeed, the Borexino was very successful. Um, I would like to show this uh, plot. Um, here, the um, but well, the new E survival probability is plotted as a function of the neutrino energy. And these are the Borexino data. 
And, well, here's the PP, neutrino, barium-7, PEP, boron-8. And clearly, the data are just consistent with the MSW prediction, which is shown by this curve. So with this, uh, with this data, we were really convinced, convinced that MSW is right. Also, uh, well, I want to mention that they, uh, that Brexino also observed the uh, CNO neutrinos. I think that was really a great achievement. Finally, I also, I also want to mention one more thing. Well, due to the matter effect in the Earth, we expect that the night, uh, nighttime solar new flux is slightly higher than the daytime flux. And this is the predicted solar new denunciation probability in, in daytime and nighttime. So in the high energy region, we expect a slightly higher nighttime flux. And this prediction was tested in Super Kamiokande. And this is the uh, uh, most recent Super Kamiokande data. Um, the, here, the day-night asymmetry is shown for each Super K phase. And by combining all these data, the day-night asymmetry they observed is um, 2.86, uh, minus 2.86 percent with, with these statistical and systematic errors. So now Super Kamiokande has a three sigma evidence for the day-night effect. That is another confirmation of the MSW effect. <coughs> okay, well, then in the remaining 10 minutes or so, I want to briefly discuss the discovery of new gene oscillation, third oscillation channel. Well, uh, in 1998, we understood new mu oscillate to new tau. Then in 2001 or 2002, we understood that new E oscillate to new mu plus new tau. Then, of, since there are three neutrino flavors, there should be the third mixing angle. Therefore, after the discovery of solar neutrino oscillations, and the neutrino community's interest was the discovery of the third oscillation channel. And for this, um, these experiments contributed. Um, one category of ex experiments are the accelerator-based long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments. In these experiments, they wanted to observe the electron neutrino appearance from the muon neutrino beam. Another experiment is the reactor-based short baseline experiment. In these experiments, they wanted to observe the disappearance of new E bars at a distance of one to two kilometers. Well, remarkably, in the, uh, well, these experiments showed their first result around 2011 or 2012, and the data presented at that time are shown here, and all these experiments were just consistent. Um, Accelerator-based experiments observed a slight excess of um, new, e new E's, and reactor experiments observed a deficit of uh, the disappearance of new, new E, new E bus, sorry. So, at that time, we understood the basic structure for three flavor neutrino oscillations. <coughs> now, okay, therefore, I, from now on, I briefly discuss the states, status and future. Well, first of all, um, I would like to summarize the experiments 
that contributed to the three flavor neutron oscillation studies? Well, first of all, there are many experiments that contribute to, uh, to our, our understanding of the three flavor oscillations. And well, this is the oscillation parameters. Um, well, of course, maybe this is already a little bit old, but anyway, um, these are the oscillation parameters. And, and first of all, already at the time of 2021, um, the accuracy is rather remarkable. So there are three mixing angles, but well, all of them are measured within a few percent. Also, delta M square, again, measured within 3%. Well, this was, this was in, my, in my opinion, this precise measurement was were rather remarkable. <coughs> uh, by the way, unfortunately, at this moment, we do not know if the third mass eigenstate nu3 is the heaviest or the lightest. Therefore, there are two ambiguities. Uh, so therefore, in these graphs, there are two possibilities uh, written. Also, um, we do not know much about the uh, CP phase parameter. Anyway, um, in addition to, the, to this uh, precise parameter determination, essentially, we understood that neutrino mass is very small, probably more than 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding mass of Cox and Charles leptons, very small. And neutrino mixing angles are large compared with the uh, corresponding Cox mixing angles. So I think these are the two main things we understood. <coughs> but, we do not understand everything in, on, related to the neutrino mass and mixings. As I mentioned, we do not know the nu3 mass eigenstate is the heaviest one or the lightest one. We do not know uh, about the CP phase, and we think that CP vibration in the neutrino sector might be very important for the understanding of the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Um, also, uh, we do not know very well about the absolute neutrino mass. And finally, um, we do not know much about the uh, structure beyond the three flavor framework. Well, of course, uh, at the neutrino conference in Milano last week, people are kindly begin to say that uh, stellar neutrino evidence is fading away, but not completely. Therefore, um, we still have to, uh, we, we, sh we should not forget about this possibility yet. And finally, um, we do not know if neutrinos are Majorana particles. And in order to test, uh, this idea, neutrino less double beta decay is very important. So it's clear that we have many important measurements to be done in the future. OK, um, let me summarize. Proton decay experiments in the 80s observed many contained atom sec neutrino events and discovered atom sec mu neutrino deficit. And subsequently, in 1998, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations. And solar neutrino experiments began in the 60s, and various solar neutrino experiments before year 2000 observed a deficit of solar neutrinos. And then the snow experiment discovered solar neutrino oscillations by the measurements of charged current and neutral current reactions of solar neutrinos. And since then, Various experiments have studied neutrino oscillations. So 
now we understand rather well about the whole structure of neutrinos and neutrino mass and mixings. The discovery of non-zero neutrino mass opened the window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics, and neutrinos might also be the key to understand the baryon asymmetry of the universe. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Francesco Vissani from uh, Gran Sasso Lab. Uh, I would like to ask a, a general question concerning theory. So you discussed the, uh, in the role of Bacal, very important for solar neutrino. You mentioned also the calculation of, uh, say, atmospheric neutrino flux, which were uh, since 60 uh, reliable, used by this CWI and Collar. And uh, we may remember Sakata, uh, hypothesis of mixing of neutrino, which is uh, uh, already 62, Ponte Corvo oscillation. So this is very useful. Or Mikheyev, Smirnov, no? Then, uh, when you think to modern theorists, uh, uh, some people believe in a small mixing angle solution because it, uh, is, if it's uh, prejudice, uh, and this is wrong, some people argue that theta one three is zero, and all kinds of mistakes uh, were done. So my question is, uh, is theory worsen or there are more type of theories? Uh, I mean, we should distinguish more uh, what is theory, what is useful theory. I mean, I know that it's a bit uh, um, difficult question, but this is a meeting of theorists and it, it would somehow to give uh, some uh, view ideas. Well, okay, thank you very much for this question. It's very difficult to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, however, in my opinion, for example, uh, when we encounter atomic muon neutrino deficit, of course, immediately as a possibility, we thought about neutrino oscillations. Well, of course, the framework is simple, um, and therefore, we, we thought if the mixing angle is large, then this could be a solution, but again, yeah, as you mentioned, people generally believed at that time mixing angle should be very small. Therefore, actually, well, to be honest, I myself didn't expect to observe neutrino oscillations in atmospheric neutrinos. But, well, anyway, um, in my opinion, on this, say, general framework work of, on neutrino oscillation was a kind of solid one. Uh, therefore, uh, we thought this could be a possibility. And in fact, if mixing angle is large, that could have a, a significant implication to our understanding of uh, particles. Uh, therefore, we were excited and <laughs> I, I think we, we need to collaborate between experiment and theory. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brahim uh, Safa, Columbia University. Um, one, of, one of the things that has been basically remarkable to see about uh, Super, Super K is not just its initial success, but its continued success in reinventing of the experiment now several times, right? Um, that's something rare to see in the experimental world, I think. Um, so I was going to ask you, do you have any insights on maybe some keys to that, <clears throat> keys to that success? Is it a special set of circumstances or are there things about the super K culture that promote um, this bold reinvention uh, multiple <laughs> times. Well, again, thank you very much. This is, again, a very, very difficult question to answer. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, um, we, I think we were really fortunate 
and we have been receiving the support from the Japanese government for the operation of the Super Kamiokande detector. And, and therefore, we, we were able to continue improve our detector system. And that was indeed very important uh, for the solar neutrino measurements. Um, for example, well, initially, I think Super Kamiokande analysis ratio was about 5.5 MeV, but since then, they continue to try to improve, and now it's 3.5 MeV or so. And therefore, with this, with this lower threshold energy data, uh, we begin to see an upturn of the uh, oscillation probability. Um, so, as I said, uh, long-term support was the, one of the key. Um, in addition, well, of course, um, there were some kind of crazy idea to put gadolinium into the super K tank. Well, initially this was a crazy idea, but some people thought this seriously and started the serious R&D work. And after, say, more than 10 years of R&Ds, people finally found a way to put gadolinium into super Kamiokande tank and, the, and at the same time to make it clean. So um, I think this kind of emerging idea is also very important. Thank you for a nice So it seems like we have uh, plenty of strong evidence of the uh, neutrino oscillation. So uh, what do you expect about for the hyper -K, the next generation? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, in hyper Kamiokande, actually, um, one of the uh, most important physics uh, target is the clear measurement of the CP violation. Um, well, in order to um, understand the baryon asymmetry of the universe, the one of the what, what, one of the important criteria is to have the CP variation in the neutrino sector. Um, therefore, we'd like to have um, the measurement of the uh, neutrino oscillation and anti-neutrino oscillation difference. Using the actually using the beam created by J Park accelerator. In addition, of course, uh, the hyper Kamiokande mass is about eight times larger than the super K mass. Uh, therefore, we'd like to improve various measurements and in, in neutrinos. And in addition, again, well, because of the large mass, we'd like to continue the search for proton decays. If the proton, true proton lifetime is shorter than 10 to 35 years, and the main decay mode is E plus pi zero, super K, uh, no, hyper K should be able to observe it, the decays. Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you very much for this nice overview of neutrino oscillation. So I have a very naive question. So the neutrino oscillation data fits uh, very well with good precision using the three flavor scenario, right? So what opportunities left for the new physics like uh, NSI, decay and decoherence, those kind of stuff within the oscillation data? Thank you. Well, well okay, I am not very, uh, actually I, at present, uh, as uh, I discussed tomorrow, I'm now working on gravitational wave, therefore I'm not completely following the recent development, but um, well, NSI or some kind of other, new, uh, other physics, we should not forget. Therefore, we should try to analyze, assuming these kind of new things. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, there is no such effect. But we should not forget. I have a question about something you mentioned when you were making the transition from um, snow to um, Camlan. So you said 
that um, after the, the, um, the snow result, there were still some, well, or doubts or alternative explanations that, were, that did not involve oscillations that then were, were that they disappeared after the Kamlan uh, result. And I was curious about which were the, the alternatives at the time. Yeah, well, okay, as far as I remember, one of the uh, possible alternative was the uh, uh, Michino magnetic moment. Okay. Is that they would, they would create the uh, X, so they would increase the, the neutral current. Uh, uh, they, they would convert new E to other, uh, to other neutrinos. But at, at, at the uh, interaction site, not, don't, not as a result of oscillations. Hmm? You. So at the interaction site. Ah, uh, no, no, no. no, not, no. Not, not, not in, I mean, not, not through oscillations. So the, the, the magnetic moment would increase the, the cross section. Magnetic is at the moment uh, flip the neutrino flavor. Uh huh. So it's, but this is, oscill oh, well, in the, in the interaction, not no, no, in no, oscillation. No. Os between the generation and the detection. So, it's, so it would be an oscillation effect anyway, right, in that case? Uh, well, it, I don't know if it can be said oscillation. Oscillation is this one. <laughs> okay, Conversion. so the, the, pa the pattern would have been different. Yeah. That's the, the L over E uh, pattern. Okay, I see, thanks. Morning, and first of all, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice uh, lecture. I am uh, Noemi Finetti from L'Aquila Un University and uh, Florence INFN. Um, I, I would like to know what's about uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, geoneutrinos, because Geoneutrinos, uh -huh, uh -huh. uh, because I guess that I am not an expert, uh, <laughs> that we have to make some guess in order to estimate the contribution of uh, the geoneutrinos background. I, but I don't know, I mean, we don't know uh, the um, inner of the heart, I mean, so it's quite difficult to make uh, an estimation, I guess, but I, I, I don't know really. Yeah, well, <laughs> for the geoneutrinos, again, well, in my case, I am not uh, an expert. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, the, I think one, one fortunate issue is the energy spectrum of geoneutrinos and the reactor neutrinos are different. Geoneutrinos are lower, and we understand the flux, well, flux shape of the geoneutrinos because they are the beta decay neutrinos. And therefore, um, uh, in my opinion, the measurement itself is clear. The, uh, about the interpretation, I am not sure to, to what accuracy we can say. I, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert on this issue. Hello, thank you for a nice talk. Um, I'm actually quite, how to say, like, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, like, before people convinced by the neutrino oscillation, but, like, first to see the uh, solar neutrino problem, like, we did the deficit of the uh, solar neutrino, then, like, you saw some uh, uh, plot that it, there is the expectation of the uh, also a neutrino flux and the, how much it deficit, and the error was quite small expected. So like, I would like to know like, what status of the, the people understanding about the sun or like star formation or star uh, structure or what, what was the status at the time? <laughs> Thank you very much. E well, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think you are right. Um, the, if we simply believe the uh, estimated uncertainty by the theory um, clearly already in, in the 20th century. The data cannot be explained by the uncertainty of the uh, uh, theory, standard solar model. However, people are uh, hesitated to conclude with this data that 
the data showed evidence for the neutrino oscillations. People are still uh, seeking some other possibilities to explain the data. Uh, because, well, of course, neutrino oscillation is a big conclusion. They wanted to be 100% sure. And therefore, they wanted to wait the snow experiment. That is what I think, honestly. Okay, thank you.